Hello, congregation, family, and friends. I pray that all is well with you. Welcome to our Sunday message. Let me ask you a question. Do you think there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom? In your mind, do you equate them that they're the exact same thing, or are they something totally different? Knowledge and wisdom. Well, I submit to you that they are two totally different things. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking at a, a few verses in James chapter 1 today. And we'll be looking at a couple of other verses too that I want to add into this message. And I'm entitled this message, Lack Wisdom? Ask God. And what I submit to you is this, that we can gain knowledge in all kinds of ways, but only God can give us wisdom. We can learn knowledge from books and from video sources from many different asking people advice, we can gain all kinds of knowledge. But if we don't know what to do with that knowledge, that's where wisdom comes in at. That's where discernment comes in at. And I say that only God can give us wisdom. And so I want to start with a passage in James chapter 1 where it talks about this. If you have your Bibles or if you're taking notes, it's James chapter 1 beginning in verse 5 says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let's stop it right there. What is James telling us here? He's telling us that if any of us lack wisdom, and so we need to make a discernment, is there a difference? See, you and I could consider ourselves to be knowledgeable people. We go to school or we study courses or just life experiences gives us a whole lot of knowledge about things. But what do we do with all of that knowledge? How do we harness that? How do we use it for a greater good? How do we come to decisions that are godly? Well, James is telling us, if any of us lack wisdom, then we can ask of God. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, not ask of other people. Does that mean we can't receive wisdom from people? No, that is not what I'm saying. But if we are truly seeking godly wisdom, then we need to go to God. And I'll show you an example. Do you remember the story of Solomon? You can read about this in 1 Kings chapter 3. I've taught on this passage before. But I encourage you to read that passage in 1 Kings 3 where Solomon is now going to become king because it's passing on from David. And what does Solomon ask? God asks him, what is it that I shall grant you? What did Solomon ask? He asked for wisdom. He asked for understanding. He asked for discernment because he had to have this wisdom to rule his people. And God said, you have asked wisely. And because you've asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you wealth. And I'm going to give you riches. And I'm going to give you these other things. But the first thing that Solomon asked for was wisdom. Not knowledge. Wisdom. And you'll know right after that what happens. Immediately, Solomon's wisdom is put to the test when the two women come to him. Remember, each one of them have a child and one of them dies in the night and the one mother switches the dead baby for the live baby. How did Solomon figure that one out? Well, as you read through 1 Kings 3, you probably already know the story. He asked someone to bring him a sword and he was going to cut the living baby in half and give half to the one mother and half to the other. And he figured out through wisdom, through discernment, not just knowledge, through wisdom, through godly wisdom, he found out who the real mother was. And everyone was astonished. They said, where did this come? How did he know these things? He only knew it because God had granted him wisdom. And so I asked the question again, do you lack wisdom? Then ask God, because only God can give us true godly wisdom. Now, there's a proviso with this, of course. As we're looking at James 1, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Okay, that's easy enough to do, right? Lord, I need wisdom. We saw what Solomon did. I need wisdom for this situation, or I need that. Maybe you're wrestling with some issues right now. I can tell you right now, I'm wrestling with some issues, some heavy issues, some issues that require major decisions, life-changing decisions. Am I going to rely on my own knowledge? Am I even going to rely on advice or knowledge of other people? Yes, I will take that advice. 
But what I need is wisdom. I need godly wisdom. I need the wisdom that comes from an infinite God that will guide me and direct me. And so I'm not just preaching with, to you guys. Every time I come on here, every time I preach, whether it's in the pulpit or on line or wherever I am, I'm preaching to myself first. I need to hear this message. I need to make sure that I'm getting the wisdom that I need from God to make godly decisions. And so when I'm reading James here, and he says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Okay, that's step number one. We ask of God. We ask God for wisdom. We don't, de we don't depend on our own minds, which are faulty. They tend to be sinful. We can, we can stumble and fall and make a bad decision. How many times in your life have you made a bad decision because you didn't consider God's will, or you didn't pray enough? or you didn't seek godly counsel, or you just simply didn't ask God for wisdom. You didn't ask God to show you the way we did it ourselves, and we wound up shooting ourselves in the foot or making a train wreck of something. I speak from experience. And so the first thing we see here is we can ask God for wisdom. And we see by the example of Solomon in 1 Kings 3 that he asked for wisdom and God granted it to him. Now, the next thing that he's talking about, it says here, it says, let him ask of God who gives to all, some translations say to all men, liberally or generously and without reproach. Now we have to determine now, how does God give wisdom? He gives it generously or liberally. He gives us as much wisdom as we need and even then some. Do you think that there was a limit on the wisdom that he gave Solomon? He gave Solomon so much wisdom that Solomon was able to discern what was happening between these two mothers with one live baby and one dead baby. And Solomon was able to resolve that. Do you think he would have resolved that on his own? Could you or I have ever come to that decision that he made without wisdom? I sure wouldn't. I wouldn't know what to do. How would you know who was the mother and who was the mother of the live baby and the dead baby without godly wisdom? How do we make decisions, parents? How do we raise our children or our grandchildren? How do we become good godparents or whatever the situation is without godly wisdom? Men, how do we lead our households without godly wisdom? How do we know which career God wants us to be in? or where he wants us to go, or what he's calling us to do, unless we have wisdom and discernment. And so we know here, it's a promise of God, that if we ask of God, he will give to all generously. He'll give you wisdom and then some. But then it also says here, he does it without reproach. You know what reproach means? It means to be disappointed or annoyed in. In other words, if we keep asking God for wisdom, he's not going to say, oh, you again? You keep asking for wisdom? No, God is not doing it. He's giving it generously. Didn't he give Jesus Christ all of Jesus? Didn't Jesus give all of himself for us? Not just a little bit. He gave generously of himself. God gives of himself to us. And so when I see in Scripture, and I'm encouraged when I see God I need wisdom. I'm seeking wisdom for this problem or this situation or this career path or this marriage issue or whatever the case is. Lord, I want to depend on your wisdom. See, I can have knowledge. I can gather and do all my research and I can have lots of knowledge, but that doesn't mean I have wisdom. Can we have a lot of knowledge without wisdom? Yes. Can we have a lot of wisdom without knowledge? I say no. You can have one without the other. You can't have this one over here without that. You can gather knowledge and do all the fact-finding you want, but you still don't have wisdom. And what happens if you don't have wisdom? You can't make those decisions that are needed. And so we see here that God gives to all people liberally or generously who ask of God. Remember Jesus said, ask and it shall be given to you. Knock, it sh the door shall be opened. It's going to be given. All we have to do is ask God for it. And he does it without reproach. He's not going to get annoyed. He's not going to get fed up that we keep asking him or he's not going to just brush us off. That's not what God does. It says, it will be given to him, the end of verse 5. Ask God, it will be given to you generously, without reproach, and it will be given 
to you. It will be, not maybe, not could be, not if God's in the mood, not if he's not too busy on the other side of the earth. He will give it to you, but we have to ask him. We have to ask God for wisdom. And how many times, seriously, does our own pride get in the way? Does our own ego get in the way? And we say, hey, I, I know how to handle this situation. And we go off and we do it. And we find out that we made things 10 times worse than when we first started. Come on. I'm not talking just to myself here. We have all been in situations that we thought we had the answer to. Maybe we thought something through. Maybe we wrote down on a piece of paper pros and cons. The one thing we didn't do was ask God. And if we are Christians, if we are children of God, if we are born again Christians, if Jesus is our Lord and Savior, why are we not tapping into that? So the question is, do you lack wisdom? Ask God. Listen, if you're married, of course you're going to ask your spouse their opinion. You may have a circle of friends or confidants. You may have a spiritual covering. There, there may be a series of people that you can ask to get knowledge, to get opinions. But when it comes down to wisdom, only God can give wisdom. But see, now here's the next part, because we, it's just not a matter of just saying, God, I want wisdom, and God says, I'm going to give it to you. Look, there's another provisor here. Look at this, verse 6. But he, this is the person who's asking for wisdom, but he must ask in faith without any doubting. You see that? You have to ask for this wisdom in faith without doubting. You can't say, God, I want wisdom, but I'm not sure if you're going to give that to me. God, you gave me wisdom, but I'm not sure this is the wisdom I was asking for. You can't say and think in your mind, I can ask God for wisdom. And if I don't like the wisdom, that means God didn't answer me. That means I can't use that wisdom. I'm doubting that God's going to give me the proper wisdom or he's going to give me the area to go in or he's going to supply the answers that I need. We cannot go to him with any kind of doubt. We have to go to him with total faith that God knows what's best for us. He wants what is best for us. He's not going to steer us wrong. He loves us. He loves us enough to give Jesus on the cross of Calvary for all those who would believe in him. Now, what kind of God would give and sacrifice his own son to pay for our sins and then not turn around and help guide us through our life? Not give us the wisdom and the direction and the care that we need. If we follow, you know, it was it, when the Israelites were in the wilderness, what did they do? They followed the pillar of cloud, which then turned into the pillar of fire which then turned back in the pillar of cloud. God was leading them. And as long as they were following God, they were going in the right path where he wanted them to go. But suppose they diverted off. That's like asking God for wisdom. He shows you wisdom. He gives you wisdom. And then you decide you want to go a different path. You can't go to God and start doubting. Where's it going to get you? But listen to this. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Do you see the metaphor there? If you're doubting God, one day he may give you wisdom, one day he doesn't. One day you can believe in God, one day you don't. One day you have a problem and so you commit your prayers to God, the next day you try to fix it yourself. You are tossed to and fro. You are like this surf that goes this way and that way. There's no stability. And James is going to say that in another verse or two. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You either ask in faith or you don't ask in faith. But you can't come to God one day, ask in faith, and believe. And the next day, you don't come to God in faith or you doubt that God is even going to give you the wisdom. Do you see? You cannot play with God that way. If you are lacking wisdom, you can ask of God. And we have a promise of God that he will give us the wisdom if we ask for it. That is a promise. Yet how often, how often do we kind of play games with God? And I'm using that in a broad sense. I'm not talking about mocking God. I'm talking about today I'm feeling, I'm feeling really stressed. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling really burdened. And so, Lord, I'm going to seek you. I'm going to unburden myself, and I'm going to seek your direction for my life. That's asking for wisdom. What direction should I go in? And then when things get better, 
When things are going smooth sailing, do we ask God for wisdom then? No, because we're on a path. God solved the problem or God made something happen. Or now we're no longer in that stressful situation. We're no longer tossing and turning at night. The bills wound up getting paid at the end of the month. We wound up getting that new job. Our marriage was put back together. Our child was reconciled to us, whatever the case may be. And now we don't need God's wisdom. We don't need to keep seeking him. How many of us, come on now, how many of us are guilty of that? We need to be consistent. If you're lacking wisdom, and I can tell you that I am lacking wisdom, doesn't mean I don't have knowledge, but I can't rely on my wisdom or the wisdom of my beloved or the wisdom of trusted counselors or those who are my spiritual covering. I can't just rely on that. I've got to go to the infinite source of wisdom, the creator of everything. Almighty God, that's who I have to go to to get ultimate wisdom. But I cannot go to him doubting. I cannot go to him and say, well, God, I really want your help, but no, there's no buts with God. You either believe he's going to give you wisdom and direction and discernment, or you don't. You can't play games. And that's what James is trying to tell us here. If you go in doubting, you are like this surf that just goes to and fro. You're tossed with the wind. One day you're into God, the next day you don't need God. The next day after that, suddenly you need God again. Then the next week you don't need God. That's a double-minded man. That is someone who is unstable. That is someone who can't even walk and talk their faith, only when it's necessary. How many of us only pray? Oh, we pray to God. Oh, we cry out to God when things are bad. And when things are good, do we still cry out to God? Do we still cry out to God when things are good? Do we still praise him for the wisdom that we have because we're walking in the will of God and things are going well? Who gave you that wisdom to do that? Was it you? Was it me? Was it our finite minds? Or was it the infinite mind of God because we asked him and we're being in obedience to him? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. Now, here's the thing. Don't lose this. Let me go back and read verse 6. He must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Verse 7. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Whoa. Did you hear that? Sometimes we gloss over that because we all know the next verse. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Did you hear verse 7? If we come to God in doubt doubting that he's going to do what he says he's going to do or we're playing with god and one day we want wisdom and the next day we don't and one day we're crying out to god and the next day we forgot about god if we're going to do that we're not only going to be tossed to and fro but we can ought to expect that we're not going to receive anything from god wow i mean that should be a wake-up call for that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from god you want to test god you want to play with God? You want to test him and decide when and if you're going to get wisdom from him? God has every right not to answer you at all, not to give you wisdom at all, not to give you what you're asking for. No man should expect that you're going to receive anything from God if you go in doubting, if you go in playing around, if you're tossed this way and that. If God guides you in a certain direction, if he gives you wisdom, in a certain direction, and you chose not to take it. And then you come back at God later on after you already ignored his path or his calling or his final decision on a matter. And you decide you don't want that decision. That doesn't fit in with your life or what you think. Then you come back to God later on. You want more wisdom. Can you expect anything from God when you are testing him like that? You're doubting God. You are putting doubt that God knows what's best for you and what's best for me. How dare any of us do that? Do we realize who we're serving here? Do we realize the God of the universe, the God who spoke the universe into being, the God who created you and me? You and I wouldn't be here without God. You and I would not have a breath in our body without God food to eat. We would not have the health that we have. You and I would not even be here right now on this technology right now if it wasn't for God. God owns everything. God is the source of everything. And if we're going to seek wisdom, if we're lacking it, we need to ask God of it. But if we ask him doubting, if we think it's a game, 
if we think that God is not going to play ball with us, if we go in with any kind of attitude like that, we can expect that God is going to do nothing for us. Why? Verse 8, because a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. One day you're on with God, the next day you're off. You're unstable. You're double-minded. You start thinking, oh, maybe this is good, maybe that is not good. Maybe God will answer me, maybe he won't. Let me take you back, if you have your Bible, let's go back to Proverbs chapter 1. You already know this verse, but I want to show you again what the difference is between knowledge and wisdom. And it says it right here in the very first chapter of Proverbs chapter 1. I think it's verse 7, if you're with me here. Listen to this. Proverbs 1 verse 7 says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, not wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Let's deal with that first. When he's talking about fear in this particular context, he's not talking about fear as in, oh, I'm afraid of God. He's a big, bad monster. We're not talking about that kind of fear. We're talking about fear as in respect, as in reverence, as starting to understand who God is, this magnificent being who created us and created the universe. The fear, the respect of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. When we start understanding who God is, that's the very beginning of compiling all of this knowledge. Where do we learn about God? Right here, right here in his book. There's 66 books to learn all about God. We got four gospels that tell us in great detail about Jesus. We have all kinds of information from the Bible. And so as we're studying it, as we're reading it, as we're learning it, as we hear it preached, as we study it on our own, or as we attend a Bible study or a church or whatever the case may be, the more you gain knowledge, that's the beginning of knowledge, learning about the fear of the Lord, having respect, revering the Lord. But verse 7 goes on from there. It says, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. See the difference? See, we can gather all the knowledge that we can, but that doesn't mean we have wisdom. And the, and the person who's running Proverbs here is saying, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom. doesn't say fools despise knowledge. There's nothing wrong with knowledge. I mean, but what do you do with all of this knowledge? You got to do something with it. That's where wisdom and discernment comes in. But fools despise wisdom. So if you want to be a double-minded man or woman, you want to play games with God, you want to decide, well, God, I can do this on my own, or I don't need your wisdom, or I don't like the wisdom you're giving me, or I don't like the solution to this problem, or this is too hard for me, you want to do that, you are despising wisdom. And we're not talking about human wisdom. We're talking about godly wisdom and instruction. Suppose part of God's wisdom for you, or for me, involves chastisement. Suppose it involves instruction. Suppose it involves relearning a career or moving to a different part of the world or whatever God may call. Suppose that wisdom came down from God and God said, this is what I want you to do and this is the path I have for you and this is godly wisdom I'm giving you and here are the instructions. This is the area I want you to go in. Remember what he did with Abraham in Genesis 12? He called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, and he said, go to a land that I'm going to show you. Abraham packed up his house, and he started going. It was a walk of faith. Six years ago, I had an Abrahamic experience. The same thing happened to me. I was living in one part of the country, and God said, pack up, and you're moving to another part of the country because I have plans for you. Now, if I had disobeyed God, I'd still be where I was before, and all of the blessings I've had since then, and all of these things that I'm doing now for the Lord would have never happened had I discerned or had my own discernment and said, God, I don't like your wisdom. I'm double-minded. I'm unstable. I'm not asking you in faith. God came to me very clearly, convicted me, and said, you are moving. Move. You are going to get married. Go get married. And these were steps of faith. But it didn't come from my wisdom. It didn't come from my knowledge. It came from God. And so I look at Proverbs 1.7, and it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My friends, don't be a fool. Don't despise wisdom. Don't despise instruction. If you lack wisdom, we have a promise from God that if we ask him for wisdom, he will give us wisdom. It will be given to us. But we have to ask in faith, 
And we have to ask not doubting. And we have to realize that when God gives us that wisdom, that we are to carry on with that wisdom, that we are to take that wisdom and use it. And if we pick and choose what we want and what we don't want, then we are no better than the person that James is talking about here in James 1, 8, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Do you remember the story in Luke chapter 2? And we'll, we'll close with this, I think. The story in Luke chapter 2, remember when um, Jesus was found in the, uh, he was in the synagogue. He was 12 years old, I think, 12, 13. And his parents had left town. They were heading back home and they realized after a day's travel that Jesus wasn't with them. They came back. Read about this story in Luke 2. They come back and they find him in the synagogue arguing with all of these learned scholarly men. They had knowledge, but they didn't have wisdom. And what does it say? It says in Luke 2, verse 52, it says, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, both with God and with men. He grew in wisdom and stature. He grew in wisdom, not just knowledge. He grew in wisdom and stature, both with God and with man. Jesus, at an early age, understood wisdom. Jesus sought wisdom. Jesus was granted wisdom. As I showed you earlier, Solomon asked for wisdom. He was granted wisdom. There is a difference, my friends. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. So what do you have today? You may have a lot of knowledge. I hope you do. I hope you have a lot of knowledge of the things that you've wanted to learn in your life, the things that you've had to learn to be a parent or have a career, whatever the situation is. My purpose in this message is to ask, do you have wisdom? And if you lack wisdom, you can get it from God. It's free for the asking. James 1 verse 5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it shall be given to you. My prayer for you today, as you are watching this, is that God grants you all of the wisdom that you need, all of the wisdom that you're seeking, for every area of your life, no matter what it is, go to God. Seek wisdom, because if you're lacking it, there's only one place you can receive true godly wisdom, and that is from God himself. If this message has helped you, if it's blessed you, please feel free to share it. God said in Isaiah 55, 11, he says, my word does not return void. It's going to reach those people he intended to reach. If it reached you today, if this spoke to you today, then this message was meant for you today. And God's word once again came true. But if you know someone else that may be needing wisdom or they need to hear a message like this, please feel free to share it. This is God's word going out. This is God's word. Please feel free to share it. The other thing I always ask you to do, every broadcast, is to be a Berean. The Bereans, we learn about them in Acts 17, verses 10, 11, and 12. It's the only places you can read about these people who lived in Berea. Well, Paul and Silas went up to preach to them, and it says in Acts 17, 11, that the Bereans received the word. They received, they heard the preaching with all readiness and openness of heart. Their hearts were open, their minds were open, their souls were open, their ears and eyes were open. And it says they received the word. A lot of people don't receive the word, but they received the word. But you see, the, the beautiful thing is they didn't stop there. The Bible says in Acts 17, 11, that they then took the word, and they searched the scriptures every single day to make sure what they were hearing was true. I encourage you, do the same thing. Do the same thing with the passages I gave you. No matter who you're listening to, whether it's someone on Christian television, someone on radio, social media, maybe a church you go to, a Bible study you're part of, maybe you're reading a book from your favorite Christian author, wherever you are receiving the word. Look up the references, study the scriptures for yourself, be a diligent Berean, search the scriptures to make sure what you're hearing is true. Because let's face it, and I hate to say this, but it's the truth. There's a lot of bad teaching out there, a lot of bad preaching. Some of it is deliberate. Some people are just preaching just god-awful heresies that are leading people straight to hell. There are other people who are teaching that just don't know any better. Maybe they're not knowledgeable enough, but you owe it to yourself. You see, the more you understand the Bible, the more you understand what God says, then you can determine and have discernment, seek wisdom from God as to what is the truth and what is not. You follow those who are speaking truth and you dismiss those who are speaking untruth, particularly those that the Bible says false Christ, false prophets, false teachers, they are appearing, they're all over, they're leading a lot of people astray. 
And we have to be very careful about that. I still do it. After decades of studying scripture, I still study after every message I hear. Please do the same. Lastly, would you please pray for our ministry? We covet your prayers. We need your prayers. As you can tell, if this is the first time you're joining me, I'm a pretty bold preacher. I don't hold anything back. I don't sugarcoat the gospel. I don't tap dance around certain topics. That's not what this ministry and what this preacher is all about. I preach the whole counsel of God. And some people don't like it, especially Satan. Satan doesn't like when someone comes out and just preaches boldly in the gospel. And so Satan does everything he can to knock us down, from interrupting our broadcasts to taking away any kind of financial support that we've got, uh, which right now is down to like zero. Uh, and so would you please keep it in mind, please pray for this ministry that I will stay bold, that I will preach without fear of contradiction or fear of favor with anyone, that I will not retreat, back up, quit, go away, or sugarcoat the gospel in any way. That's not, if that's what you're looking for, this is the wrong channel for you. This is not who you, where you want to be. If you just want to hear things that tickle your ears, you won't hear that here. But if you want to hear the unadulterated, unchanging, eternal word of God, exactly the way God wrote it, that's what you're going to hear on this channel and with this ministry. So please keep us in prayer, because we have been under attack for quite a while now. Uh, and uh, you know, Satan would like nothing better than to shut us down. Lastly, if God is convicting you in any way to support us financially, we sure could use that. There's no salary here. There's, there's no big money rolling in. There's no corporate sponsors. This is a walk of faith. This is something I've been doing for years. Yes, there's other income I have from another position, of course. But if God leads you to support this ministry, we sure could use your help because we're not only on the air four or five times a week. We go into local pulpits. We travel. We do different things for God. But sometimes it does take money to do these things. So if God would lead you to support us financially, and I leave that between you and God. I'm not saying you have to write a check. You don't pay for a prophecy here. You don't have to sow a seed. None of that nonsense. But if God leads you to support us, there's two ways to do it. Three, actually. One is right through our website, livinginharmonyministries.org. One is through Facebook Messenger. It's quick, it's easy, it's safe and secure. It's done in less than a minute. And three, if you're interested, we do have a corporate mailing address that you could send to us, and we could give that to you if you private message me. So there's three ways that you could help us financially. But you know what? Even if you don't, I still want you to come back for every broadcast, every broadcast, because I want to share the Word of God with you. I want us to learn together. I want us to fellowship together as much as technology will allow us to do. And so if you're watching this live on Sunday, we're going to be back tomorrow night for Monday Night Manna, uh, week 29, I believe. Tuesday, we have a Bible study. Thursday, we have a sermon. We're planning new shows all the time. Please mark this channel down. Make sure you're on alert and come back and see us again. Thank you for being with me today, and I pray that God will give you wisdom. Thanks for being with me.